everybody, and welcome to our session on GASB 90 and other reporting entity issues. And, and we thank you for joining us today. Again, my name is Eric Berman. I am a partner uh, with Ied Bailey. Over about the next hour, uh, today's webinar is going to be discussing GASB 90 and other reporting entity issues. Uh, we decided to add on the phrase other reporting entity issues piece for several reasons. First, year in and year out, the GASB routinely gets the most technical inquiries on just what is the reporting entity of a government. And except in years of major implementations like what we have going on this year with GASB 84, and we're going to be talking about GASB 84 again coming up on March 3rd. Uh, it, and, GASB 84 does have a major interaction with the reporting entity of a government and will continue to do so over the foreseeable future. As we go along in the presentation, we'll let you in on some breaking news on that front as well. So just sit back and enjoy over the next hour or so. Today's agenda will provide an overview of GASB 90 which provides accounting and financial reporting provisions for majority equity interests. And I emphasize that phrase, uh, majority equity interests. And then we'll transition into the types of component units, including component units that are fiduciary in nature or sometimes termed uh, fiduciary component units or FCUs. I see it in a number of uh, different ways that people abbreviate it. So let's just call it uh, fiduciary component units or FCUs. Uh, <clears throat> uh, various component unit reporting issues, again, some of which may be changing in the future as a result of the financial reporting model project, which I'll talk about later on this year. Uh, separately audited departments and agencies, which are not component units, uh, but such uh, reporting is prevalent around the country. And hopefully uh, at the end of the hour, we'll have some time for your questions. But as we do with every webinar, we save all your questions and, and uh, I get back to you by email uh, directly if need be. So away we go. Uh, for such a short statement, GASB 90 impacts a lot of sections of GAP despite having a standard section of only seven paragraphs in length. Uh, the GASB codification sections include the reporting entity determination section, which is 2100, uh, the reporting of component unit section, which is 2600, uh, the investment codification uh, section, which is I-50, and some minor impacts on other sections. Uh, the focus today, though, at least of this part of the webinar, is to discuss how a majority equity interest could be an investment. Uh, the effective date is now. Um, the, if there is a majority equity interest that needs to be reported, a change in reporting entity may result, which would trigger a beginning balance adjustment. For December 31st, 2019 entities, that means January 1st, uh, except for comparative financial statements, when the restatement would go back another year, unless it is not practicable to do so. But in many cases, the information may be reasonably available to restate properly. In certain circumstances in GASB 90, though, uh, the implementation is prospective. Um, what are some of the big deals of GASB 90? First, the interest must be in a legally separate entity. And we're going to see that phrase over and over and over again over the hour. Uh, the, the phrase legally separate entity is vitally important in determining uh, what is your reporting uh, entity. Depending upon management intent in the equity interest, the holding of the interest may result in a component unit or an investment. And again, it really comes down to management intent. And obviously, that's something that would have to be uh, uh, documented as part of, uh, as part of uh, your uh, implementing of GASB, uh, GASB Statement 90. Depending on how the interest is currently reported, 
there could be an adjustment that is necessary of your beginning balance. If the interest is held within a fiduciary activity, uh, the interest automatically will be an investment. For all other activities, analysis will be necessary uh, based again on management intent. And again, there could be some instances where the implementation of GASB 90 uh, is potentially reported on a prospective basis rather than on a uh, restatement or retrospect retrospective uh, basis. So, what is a majority equity interest? Uh, again, it needs to be in a legally separate organization evidenced by ownership of voting shares, uh, not just shares, but voting shares of stock or of, of partnership interests. The voting share aspect is important as in many situations, a government may hold a majority interest but have minimal or no voting rights. The rights must be based on a government's investment of financial or capital resources. There must be some form of consideration that is measurable, explicit, and relatable to determining the share of the investee's resources that the government actually owns. And think of it this way, there could be situations where for example, in a, in a uh, housing, uh, uh, low-income housing uh, transaction, the government may hold a very, very high uh, ratio or a high percentage of an equity interest, but may not have a majority voting interest because the limited partners in the transaction may hold the voting interest. It really depends on the transaction and the details of the contractual relationship. So again, this relationship must be explicit. And again, the consideration, which is the form of compensation to the investee must be measurable, explicit, and relatable to determine the share of investees resources that the government owns. Think of it this way, that, that in, in essence, the government is playing Shark Tank. So why is this a big deal? It became a big deal due to the issuance of GASB 72 fair value measurement and application, which was followed closely by GASB 80 uh, blending requirements for certain component units. Based on the provisions of those two standards, GAP became inconsistent, especially in the case of closely related entities to travel governments, economic development, public housing, public education entities uh, with foundations or research and development uh, entities, or in other governments that may have close to not-for-profit or even for-profit operations. For example, a public hospital may have a majority interest in a not-for-profit, and that interest was likely inconsistently reported prior to GASB 90. And the fact pattern that I have on the screen here is very common, especially in the public housing uh, public hospital sector, where there's a rehab center that, it, that is connected to the public hospital. And in this case, we have a 75% equity interest in the rehab center, and a not-for-profit holds the remainder. Now, prior to GASB 90, we would have had to make a decision as whether or not this is a component unit or an investment. And if it's an investment, how should we report it? Uh, should we report it using the equity method or should we report it at fair value? And if the hospital acquire, uh, acquires the remaining 25%, is it now a component unit or is it still an investment? And if it's a component unit, do we report it as discreetly presented or blended? So you can see this is just a very, very complex situation that GASB 90 attempts to fix. And here's the fix, that you have a majority equity interest as evidenced by the voting shares. And, and the, the, initial, the only real decision is made, that is need to be made is, is does the holding of this, uh, of this entity meet the definition of an investment 
And as we all know, an investment is an asset we hold for income or profit. So if the answer is yes, the interest is then accounted for using the equity method since we have the majority equity interest. Now, for most of us, including me, the last time that I actually had to do the debits and credits on, on the equity method other than writing about it uh, or doing it while training uh, folks such as you was probably when I was sitting for the CPA exam. Uh, so we may have to resurrect it one more time. The exception is again, if the interest is held in a fiduciary fund or by the way, also a permanent fund. Instead of using the equity, equity method in those situations, we use fair value. If the answer is no, it is not for income or profit, then the interest it, it is a component unit and then we go down the decision making of whether the interest is a blended component unit or discreetly presented. The interest is, is an asset of the government or fund that holds the interest. We then measure that interest also using the equity method. If the resulting entity is blended, it is then eliminated in the blending process. Otherwise, it's discreetly presented. If a government acquires 100% equity interest, it is initially recorded at acquisition value. The value is, is then determined by the consideration paid plus the equity interest asset in deferred outflow of resources that were, were acquired. The net position acquired should then equal the net position of the component unit. So again, pretty simple decisions once you know the facts. Here's another way to look at the decision-making process. If it's reported as a component unit, report uh, things on a prospective basis only. Otherwise, it's a restatement. And I put the exceptions on, uh, to the uh, decision-making down at the bottom of the screen. So save this for your future use. So what are the other focus areas of GASB 90? Hopefully this will bring some clarity for the entities we talked about a few, a few minutes ago, but there could be others involved. As I mentioned here, economic development is a big deal for many governments who are enticing companies to locate in their areas by holding a, a potentially a majority equity interest. Public housing is also a pretty big deal. Healthcare providers, hospitals, doctors' practices, HMOs, foundations of colleges and universities. There, uh, there are a lot of entities that may be subject to GASB 90. I mentioned a few slides back that uh, about acquiring a 100% equity interest. If that occurs, this provides you with a summary of what is required in the debits and credits and also in the disclosure. Obviously, it's far more intricate than, than what you see on this slide. One thing that, that I, you know, I'd, I'd offer to you is that if you happen to be in this situation, I'd like to talk to you about it. Or, of course, any of our Ide Bailey professionals would love to talk to you about it. Because this could be a very, very uh, uh, specific uh, situation that may require some special uh, consulting. So, Let's say the acquisition of a majority equity interest conjures up these thoughts of just really, what is my government's reporting entity? You may be thinking like that now saying, wait a second, I heard that term reporting entity. How do I, how do I determine that? You may not have even revisited it recently. After all, the original standards have been in place since the mid 1990s and they've been amended many times. And a lot of us, we haven't really changed our, our view on the reporting entity despite the fact of all these amendments. So let's take a step back and look at your government's reporting entity. These relationships may result in many different arms, the most common being component units that are either reported as blended component units or discreetly presented component units, or component units that are fiduciary in nature. But there are other relationships we tend to forget. Joint ventures are very common, jointly governed organizations, other standalone governments and related organizations. All these relationships we should at least disclose in text. And a lot of these we tend to forget about. 
as I say here, knowing the jargon is just as important in my mind as understanding what it is a component unit. That phrase legally separate appears here more than once uh, regarding all the different types of component units. And, and so for those of you who have printed this out, you may want to dog ear this page or, or if you have it on your screen, bookmark it. Because in practice, you're going to be revisiting this over and over again. And it does tend to change every few years. Look, we had a recent change in GASB Statement 80. And now we have another change in GASB Statement 90, not 10 years, uh, not 10 uh, standards later. We may be about to have, an, have another change coming up over the next few months uh, with a potential exposure draft I'm going to tell you about in a few minutes. So again, this jargon becomes really important. And look at the differences between a component unit, uh, between a blended component unit and a discreetly presented and component units that are fiduciary in nature. And then let's take a look at all these other uh, entities that are on the screen. Uh, jointly, joint venture versus a jointly governed organization. Uh, look at the difference in, in a jointly governed organization. And the most common of a jointly governed organization are these regional governments or other multi-government arrangements that are governed by representatives that create the organization, but it's not a joint venture because there's not an ongoing financial interest or responsibility. And in some cases, they result in some form of shared service arrangement. And look at the other uh, standalone governments. Uh, this is kind of interesting because in this case, there's no separately elected body and it doesn't meet the definition of a component unit. Yet these other standalone governments exist. So these can be pretty complex relationships. Now, obviously, uh, there, there is a, a major relationship between uh, component units and the primary government, and, but this, legal, this concept of legal separation uh, tends to be a little bit hard to understand. It, some of the basics of this legal separation are that, are that there, there are some form of separation of involving corporate powers at the organization uh, involved in the, in the analysis. So if you think about it in a county situation, you may happen to have a, a water authority or a sewer authority or, uh, or something similar that has a separate set of corporate powers, including the ability to buy, sell, lease, issue debt in its own name, to sue or be sued, and to at least have some form of corporate seal or a charter. Uh, that all depends on state law or regulation as to the form of, of organization that it is. Uh, do they need a charter or a seal or something similar? Some component units do have the ability to tax or generate fees or fares or bills or rates. I, again, I mentioned a water or a sewer authority, which is pretty co common. Uh, they could also have very autonomous operations, but in some cases they may not. It's really all about this word accountability. Is there some form of accountability between the government, uh, meaning the component unit in the primary government, or the component unit in the citizenry. There is operational accountability and financial accountability. One obviously has to do with finances and the other doesn't. Component unit relationships are mainly based though on financial accountability, which is different than operational accountability. Operational accountability is mainly in the form of compliance. I mentioned a few times about GASB 84 in fiduciary component units. It may be the most overlooked provision of GASB 84. And, and guess what, folks? Breaking news, it may change again. As the provisions stand now, generally, pensions and OPEB plans held in trusts are legally separate. 
a government may be financially accountable to these plans if they make employer contributions to the plan. It is well documented about what are the hallmarks of a trust and they are on here and on the screen again and 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 you may want to again uh, consider these aspects as to whether or not you you have a trust. It, are the assets held uh, administered through a trust or some form of equivalent arrangement in which the government is not a beneficiary? Are the assets dedicated to providing benefits in accordance with the plan terms, which usually also includes administrative expenses? And are the assets legally protected from the creditors of the government? If these asset, if these elements are in place, then there is legal separation but that doesn't mean there's a component unit relationship uh, established. Ad additional determinations are needed. So again, um, there are some elements of fiduciary activities, but once we, uh, in, the, in the case of a primary government and a plan, but once the legal separation is determined, we still need to analyze uh, whether or not there is a component unit relationship. So I mentioned this could be changing very, very soon, it, it, as, as, especially with respect to fiduciary component unit relationships. There are a few questions in the GASB 84 implementation guide discussing potential component unit relationships. But these questions and others that have been proposed but not approved as of yet have called into question the relationship between a primary government and especially 457B plans. And I know many of you may have 457B plans out there, but a lot of us forget that 457B plans are specifically mentioned as not pension plans. They are deferred compensation plans. Uh, there are all, but there are also other relationships such as 401a plans and so on. Many of these have trusts. 403b plans are not required to have a trust, but they are subject to what's called the exclusive benefit rule within the Internal Revenue Code, which requires assets only in tax sheltered annuities or mutual funds. And the benefits can only be paid to beneficiaries or participants. If there are employer contributions into these trusts, then many in practice consider these plans, including 457 plans to be legally separate defined contribution plans. But in reality, this is not quite clear. So the GASBY's in the process of proposing to amend paragraph seven of GASBY 84 in emphasizing that it is only for defined benefit relationships, not defined contribution plans. This proposal, and again, this is breaking news, this proposal is, it will be issued probably instead of by the end of March, they're speeding it up a little bit. Uh, it should be approved by the board uh, probably by March 24th or March 25th, maybe even a little sooner uh, than that. They're working as fast as they can. Uh, and comments may be, uh, may be, uh, have to be sent to the GASB by mid-April. Uh, and a final standard would be issued by the end of June. That said, uh, the goal is to have, have this released again in final form, but it may include an implementation period of periods beginning after June 15, 2021. The, this project though is only gonna focus on 457B plans. Uh, and whether or not they're uh, legally separate and so on. Uh, otherwise, it appears to be a very limited scope. For other plans, GASB 84 provisions will apply. And we'll revisit these in a couple of weeks and discuss more on the exposure draft. And again, that's coming on March 3rd. So join us back then when we, re uh, when we revisit, uh, revisit GASB 84 in its entirety. And again, here are the key issues. 
Uh, and so watch our website uh, on this. It could result in a delay of at least one question uh, within the GASB 84 implementation guide. Uh, it, and it actually may result in an elimination of question 4.6, but none of this is finalized until the GASB finalizes. So don't take it to the bank until uh, the GASB finalizes, and they may not finalize until June. So back to our component interrelationships. Assuming that we have legal separation, what's next? Well, there are three basic steps as we have it on the screen. First, you need to determine if there is fiscal independence or dependence, determine the relationship of the component unit or if there is one, and then if there is a component unit, how to report things. The concept of fiscal dependency can be a little bit of a, a uh, tricky business. As discussed on the screen, there are several levels to this decision. Can the entity determine its own budget, levy taxes, set fees, fines, fares, or other rates? Is it, can they issue debt all without uh, approval? Are there other factors uh, present? And any of those factors can uh, result in some form of separation between the primary government and the potential component unit. If, if for example, if there is some form of approval required by the primary government, then the relationship may be more what is termed ministerial as there is a tremendous amount of oversight. I mentioned a while back about this uh, word accountability and, and so on, and uh, operational accountability and financial accountability. And it really flows through much of what we do when we analyze a reporting entity relationship. One of the issues that needs to be considered is whether the primary government, uh, whether the primary government appoints a voting majority of the board. But in some cases, there is no board as the primary government acts as the board. This is the case when officials of the primary government act as the board of the component unit. And again, some of this accountability aspects uh, it flows from the relationship between the government and the potential component unit. For example, is there some form of appointment authority, operational authority, or, or reporting authority? Is there some form of uh, board official that happens to be an elected official of the primary government that is sitting on the board of the potential component unit? And again, there is financial accountability versus operational accountability, all of which need to be analyzed as part of whether or not a component unit relationship exists. And if the answer is yes, what type of component unit is it? So assuming that we have legal dependency uh, and legal separation uh, with financial accountability, which could be a component unit, then what's next? Uh, again, we're thinking about voting majority. We talked about that a little bit in our last slide. Uh, the appointment should be substantive. And there, and there may be some other form of accountability that needs to be addressed. Now, this appointment authority uh, should be, could be dependent on what type of authority there is. So for example, if there's a slate that is nominated by the primary government and, and the component unit has to accept that particular slate, well, that might not be a dependency that might not be a substantive appointment. So I put in some examples here of what would result in a potential voting majority and versus a simple majority. And again, a lot of this is written down within the GASB uh, implementation guidance questions. Change. Are we, uh, I'm hearing some back chatter. Are we okay, Nanette? We're okay. Okay, thank you so much. I put in some examples of, of where a voting majority may or may not be present versus a simple majority. And so you may wanna review these uh, at your leisure, 
but these are pretty much straight out of the Gatsby, Gatsby implementation guide questions. Uh, and, and think about it when you, when you see a nominating process. Do we actually have a voting majority? Do we actually have uh, continuing appointments? Uh, do we have accountability uh, that is there? And again, a voting majority concept is pretty much uh, is a hallmark of legal separation. Here we have some simple facts and, and some examples of it of where a voting majority may be present and where a voting majority may not be present. But again, this is only one of the aspects we need to examine as part of our component unit relationships. So I mentioned a concept of what's called imposition of will. Another way to think about it is the word influence. Any one of these elements uh, on the screen can indicate some form of imposition of will. But the ultimate goal is determining who is ultimately in charge. Is it the primary government or is it the organization that we are analyzing? And if you, and if you look at the bottom set of bullets there, any one of these elements down there can indicate some form of imposition of will. And if you have some form of imp imposition of will, then you have to go on to the next step in a component unit anal relationship analysis. And that is, is there some form of financial benefit or burden? In many situations, there is a financial burden between the primary government and potential component units. These are in the form of continuing uh, appropriations for operations or guarantees for debt, financing of deficits, uh, which occurs very, very often, and other forms of financial burdens. But it could also be the reverse, where the primary government is entitled or has the ability to access the resources of the potential component unit. But perhaps the most common that I see in practice is the financing or of support or an obligation of debt or even uh, employer contributions into a uh, pension or OPEB plan, which are mandatory. Those are about the most common things that I see in practice, uh, indicating a financial benefit or burden. I put some examples of these concepts on one slide. Again, you may want to fold this one back and bookmark it uh, or bookmark it if you have uh, these slides electronically. Uh, and here are some common ones that we run into in practice. You know, the center column there that says after an annual deficit calculated, a primary government funds the deficit to a net zero. Uh, I've seen that in transportation entities. Uh, employer contributions into defined benefit plans, that's obviously very common. Percentage of sales taxation that funds transportation, uh, minimum annual appropriations to subsidize education, all of those could be a legal obligation to finance support or contributions. But also look over on the right where there's a legal obligation to pay a component unit's debt in the case of a default. That could be an example of a financial burden. And so think about that as you're, as you're going through the analysis. So as a result, how do we put this all together? The result could be some organizations have a benefit burden relationship, even though there, there could be no voting majority, or in the case of some post-employment benefits, not even a board. There are many different possibilities and outcomes that, that could occur. And I put some of these on the screen. When I was a preparer, I had 61 potential component unit relationships. Each had to be analyzed with each gap change in the reporting entity or a change in law. And so that happened, that happened all the time. Even the same facts can provide different outcomes. Uh, here I have a housing authority pattern, um, and if there are subtle changes, different outcomes can result. So here we have a housing authority created by a city as a, as a separate body corporate. We have some facts as to how the board is organized. Well, in the initial analysis, it might not even be a component unit. Uh, 
it would be a related organization because there's no imposition of will or no financial benefit or burden. But that if the city provides free accounting services, which is very common, this could be a discreetly presented component unit. Or let's say the housing authority makes payments in lieu of taxes to the city. That could be a discreetly presented uh, component unit. And as I mentioned at the bottom of the screen, there are 41 other variations we could go through on this one which makes component unit and reporting and entity analysis very, very difficult to go through. And so think about it as you, as, you, uh, as you prepare your financial statements or for the auditors in the audience, about how we deal with our, our and, and interact with our clients. There could be uh, similar facts, but different outcomes based on the facts and circumstances. Now, I mentioned uh, when I started uh, this uh, seminar, uh, joint organizations. These are common, and I have some of the, these sort of uh, organizations on the screen. Councils of governments are classic examples, but so are these transportation-oriented entities simply due to their scope of services. I was just in Washington, D.C. over the weekend, in the metro in Washington, D.C., which is the subway and bus system around there, uh, serves two states in the district. And that's a classic joint organization. The Port Authority of New York and New Jersey has airports, bridges, and other transit entities in, in New York and New Jersey. There may be situations of majority equity interests involved in those as well, as we discussed at the beginning of the hour. And again, here are the common elements of joint organizations. And, and again, none of the members appoints a majority or has control. Uh, there could be a fiscal dependency if one or more of the governments have to approve debt, as an example, and it would be a component unit of that government. So what happens if there's no financial accountability? A government may still be included, it may still include these organizations as component units if their financial statements would be misleading if they were not included. This could occur in say a municipal endowment that provides grants for teacher salaries, which it does in my town. There may be no financial accountability, but the municipality includes the endowment due to their belief that, belief that it would be misleading to exclude. So think about that if you happen to know of these relationships that are out there that just so happen to be so important to the government that even though they are legally separate, it would be misleading to exclude those, those entities. And as a repair, we, I had a few of these and we, we just documented our decision saying they would be misleading to exclude. They were one of my 61 separate children. So now that we have all these decisions, what do we do with them? There are three basic ways to include component units, blended, discrete, or fiduciary in nature. Now these fiduciary in nature component units or FCUs, they're essentially blended fiduciary funds, but they don't appear in the government wide financial statements. We must be careful as component units may have their own component units. As an example, a transit system may have a series of parking garages as their own component units, their own cost centers. But the transit system itself is a component unit of a state. These nested organizational relationships are common, and I've put a, a, some of these on the slide here. So in essence, there, there could be these three levels of reporting or three different types of reporting that are, that are evident in our annual financial reports. Most of these relationships result in an annual financial report. Most governments require them to be audited. Uh, and, and most are discreetly presented. In the case of what I call the nested component units, the coordination is tricky. For example, if a city has a June 30 year end, it may require to report component units to report by October 31st so that the city may report by November 30th. We, now we have to think backwards. Working backwards, if a component unit is a school district, 
then they may then they must be done on a timely basis. And if there is a foundation of the school district, they must be done on a timely basis. All of this must be mapped out well in advance and as part of the engagement, the city of course may be in charge, but in other situations there may be a governing law. But all of this should be laid out as, as we plan our engagements and as we plan our financial reporting process for the year. When are things due and, and what are the delivery processes and procedures? The best practice for primary governments to report is a sense of geography with materiality involved. Component units are separated between major and non-major, but many preparers confuse what is major and non-major. We, we, uh, we confuse them with the major fund formula. It's not a math formula like the major fund formula. The dependency really is about services and, board, and burdens. Yes, a decision can be made using math, but the real determination is on essential services and burden. Then the report, once you make that determination, the report is organized with discreetly presented component units to the right of the primary government in the statement and position and additional rows in the statement of activities. Combining statements may be used after the fund statements for governments with many component units. Currently, and I say the word currently in an emphasis on your gap, there is an option to present condensed information in the notes for component units. But again, breaking news, this option may be disappearing with the forthcoming, cha forthcoming changes in the reporting model. The final language is being worked on for the exposure draft and the reporting uh, model. Stay tuned for us later on in the spring, and we're gonna have two sessions on the forthcoming reporting model exposure draft. In practice, not many governments present component units information in the notes. Fiduciary component units go in the fiduciary funds, mostly in practice within pension and other employee benefit trust funds, and in some cases, external investment trust funds and private purpose trust funds. As of now, uh, for the 12-31-2019 uh, governments that have implemented GASB 84, I don't know of any custodial fund component units as of yet, I'm not sure there will be, but, I'm, but who knows, there may be something out there that you may know. What is in the notes is also very important. Some governments just copy the entirety of the notes of all component units into the notes of the government. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this is not required. Uh, and in fact, I just wrote an article about it within, within the uh, CCH Governmental Gap Update Service. So uh, you'll see that in a couple of weeks. It's not required. All you need to focus on what your government deems is essential from the component units. In practice, I see a lot of debt disclosure, and to me, that's fine. But to bring up inventory or uh, receivables or payables, that might not be essential to your primary government's operations. Remember, discreetly presented component units are discreetly presented for a purpose. They're legally separate entities. In, and for those of you who are primary governments out there, consider whether or not you need to present their notes in your notes. Now, there are some exceptions, exceptions for pensions and OPEB, which we don't have enough time to go through. Here are some best practices in it, again, uh, fiduciary component units are part of the fiduciary fund statements. No, dis no disclosure and is required though of the nature and the amount of significant transactions between the primary government and component units. And this is, this is presented in our summary of significant accounting policies. And use aggregated totals from component units and not in fund statements. Uh, if you happen to be one of those governments who who are presenting uh, uh, non-major component units in the aggregate. Use the aggregated totals. So here are some, again, blessed, uh, uh, best practices, but involved with blending uh, component units. There are a number of decisions, but again, the bottom line is, is, is if you have a blended component unit, it operates the same as, the, uh, as a fund of the primary government. Changes are it, if it is blended, especially if one of the bullets on the bottom are in place. And uh, 
And again, this is one of these pages that you may want to bookmark or dog ear. And there are some common, commonalities that we see over and over and over again in, in practice. The most common tends to be the component units governing body is the same, uh, is substantively the same as the primary government. And there is some form of financial benefit or burden. So what about these majority equity interests in a legally separate entity that turns out to be a component unit unless it's, to, unless it's an investment? Well, you report them as either discreetly presented or blended. And there's gonna be some accounting transactions that we need to make if they are blended as part of our combining process in presentation process. And these are on our screen. So here's our famous, uh, our famous decision tree, or maybe the infamous decision tree. Uh, when I was a preparer, I copied the Gatsby version of this 61 times and traced down each of my decisions using a pen and then supported with documentation behind the decision tree. And that's perfectly fine in doing that if, if, and I kind of call that old school. If you want to go old school, be my guest as long as you're consistent and you keep it updated. But this is the infamous decision tree. Will this change as part of, you, as part of future implementations? Well, time will tell. But we know this love is can't live without it. But also remember that there's a lot of language under each one of these boxes. And look at the language before we make our decisions. There are some other special provisions as well in, in component units, many of which allow certain flexibility. Intra-entity transactions and balances are common. There could be different fiscal years involved and that's perfectly okay, perfectly okay in there, as long as they're within the first quarter of the next fiscal year. That is perfectly okay because the goal is not to have the primary government's financial statements delayed. I bet some of you might not have known that. As long as we're consistently reporting and as long as it's within the first quarter of uh, after the primary government's fiscal year, we can report, uh, we can report things of a discreetly presented component unit. We need to disclose those inconsistencies due to the timing uh, in the notes. And in related organizations, we, we are required to disclose the nature of the account of any accountability between the uh, related organization and the primary government. So take a look at these and, and uh, keep these for your own uh, use. Now, I did mention uh, separately issued financial statements of component units and other special organizations. The separately issued financial statements of component units should acknowledge that they are component units of a primary government. This is usually on the title page uh, of the uh, separately uh, issued uh, component units. Uh, uh, and, and I show one on the screen here, uh, you know, the ABC Building Authority, a discreetly presented component unit of DEF City. And obviously, uh, you need to change that as needed for your organization. Uh, if I see, you know, in reviewing a set of financial statements, if I see uh, something come through with ABC Building Authority, a discreetly presented component unit of a DEF City, I know that you copied this screen. So change it for your own use. The other standalone financial statements of the component unit would report as if they are a primary government. So what we're talking about is say we have a transportation system that is that presents its own standalone financial statements, but it is a, a discreetly presented component unit. It needs to have almost the look and feel of the primary government and present, for example, a management's discussion and analysis the basic financial statements as applicable and the notes as applicable and any sort of required supplementary information. Now, obviously, if that component unit uh, does a comprehensive annual financial report, other uh, elements, including an introductory section, uh, supplementary information and statistical section are presented as well. Now, again, the related uh, for our separately issued financial statements of related organizations, uh, the disclosure includes the nature of the relationship with the primary government. 
I also mentioned at the top of the hour uh, that, that we would have a quick word on separately reported entities. And I run into a lot of these in practice. Uh, and this is where a department or an agency or a fund or a program has their own financial report. And this is common. Now, one thing that we tend to forget is that the GASB has no generally accepted accounting principles for these separately audited uh, entities. Uh, and there's no financial reporting principles. But in practice, there are, there are gap provisions that, that are accepted saying that uh, we should apply all relevant gap. The financial statements themselves should clearly indicate that, that whatever entity is, is reporting, be it the fund, the department, program, agency, whatever, should clearly indicate that it is not uh, part of the entirety of, let's say, the state of X. And so these separate, separately reported entities are common, follow the accepted practices of applying all relevant gap. Uh, but in some cases, even that is next to impossible, except to report cash and maybe capital assets. Because, of, uh, because how do you report a program unless it has its own uh, accounting system and so on? Where do we get more information on how to, how to deal with our component units? Well, there's a ton of information out there, even when codified. There are three separate codification sections and 2100 is how to determine the financial relationship between a primary government and a component unit. Code section 2600 uh, is how to report component units. And J50 is how to report these joint ventures and jointly governed organizations. And there are plenty of examples uh, that, that are included with each codification sections. There's plenty of examples of, uh, of questions and answers that, that are there. Uh, plenty of illustrations. Uh, the illustrations, for example, under joint ventures and jointly governed organizations included joint building, uh, joint financial authority, uh, finance authority, undivided interests, cost sharing or uh, entities and so on. Uh, all, again, all of these have implementation guide questions that have been amended to GASB statement number 90. And I'm sure they're gonna be amended over and over again as we go on in the, into the future. So with that, that is our hour. So let me take a, a look at some questions and answers that are on the screen here. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a, a question on, did something change with the proposed guidance that is, that is expected to come out in June based on AI, AICPA, I listened approximately two week, weeks ago, indicated that, that it would not only cover 457, but also most defined contribution plans. Good question. Um, the last week the board was working, still working on the wording of that. Uh, the, there was a representative of AICPA in the meeting. And of course the meeting was going on at the exact same time as an AICPA webinar. And a lot of the language was cha changing on the fly. Until I see something that is, uh, that is in writing and finalized by the board, I'm not exactly sure. A lot of it is conjecture. But the cover of the exposure draft, which I do have a copy of, limits it to 457B plans. There will be discussion of, the, uh, of other types of plans within the basis for conclusions. But again, this is in draft form. The current thinking is that comments will be due April 10th and uh, re-deliberation will occur during April and May with a final standard by mid-June. Uh, next, GASB 84 pension plans, separate legal entity, separate board, entity can, can issue its own debt administration. However, primary government is responsible for funding pension and therefore bears financial burden. Is this a component unit under GASB 84? I hate to use the trite phrase, it depends, but in this case, it really depends. 
it depends on whether or not the employer has mandatory contributions. It also depends on whether or not it's a defined benefit or defined contribution. It also, uh, there are a number of different aspects there, including account accountability. So in many situations, this will depend on facts and circumstances. But if there is a legally separate entity that happens to have mandatory contributions and accountability back to a primary government, such as a state, chances are that it's a component unit that is fiduciary in nature. So in many situations, PERS plans that are, that are established by states and can be potentially uh, dissolved by states, those are probably fiduciary component units. And notice I'm saying, I'm using modifiers, probably, maybe, and so on, because every situation is gonna be different. Pension plans that are established by cities uh, that are tied to cities and other similar municipalities could be component units, but in some situations may not be. And so again, it depends on facts and circumstances. And unfortunately, the GASB 84 language is not that direct. And we'll go through some more of that coming up on March 3rd. So with that, we pretty much stuck the top of the hour. Uh, if you do happen to have any form of other questions, please uh, feel free to email me. My email address is readily available on Ide Bailey's website. And we'll see you in a couple of weeks uh, when, we, when we revisit GASB 84 in its entirety. Have a good afternoon.